No matter how hard you try, you can't stop us now. No matter how hard you try, you can't stop us now. Welcome back to the broadcast, friends. Welcome back to Corbett Report Radio here on this Thursday evening. And of course, it is Thursday evening. So once again, we're going to be turning to our regular Thursday night guest, James Evan Pilato of foodworldorder.com. Quite a 180 degree turn from Oklahoma City and the solemn coverage of the 17th anniversary of the OKC attack. But there it is. And, uh, and so we'll turn our attention to the world of food, health and environment. Of course, we're talking about foodworldorder.com. If you haven't been there yet, what are you waiting for? So, James, thanks once again for your time. Hey, man, thanks so much. I, I appreciate it. I'll be your renegade of food funk that Rage Against the Machine <laughs> can, pumps me up. So I, in, in, in order to find some type of transition, I just did a quick search in the news. And, and this is what I've got for you. Oklahoma U.S. Representative Frank Lucas defends proposed cuts to the food stamp program. The U.S. House Agriculture Committee, led by Oklahoma Representative Frank Lucas, votes to cut $33 billion from the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP. But leading Democrats say the Senate will never consider the proposal. James, we've noted many, many times that this is a, now a food stamp nation. Whether or not Obama has the credit or the blame as the food stamp president, of course, we know it's a seamless transition from one to the next. The other bit from Oklahoma, and again, we've referenced kind of the mass outbreak over the past year of salmonella in what the CDC and their reports refer to as a, quote, Mexican-style fast food restaurant chain. We know full well it's Taco Bell. And 68 people were sick in last year, and that's 16 in Oklahoma, I believe, the most. And there are multiple families suing them. So more on that from Coco.com. James, that's the best I could do for you for, for Oklahoma transitions there. Well, it is a sad indictment of uh, the state of America generally right now, isn't it? You uh, kick, kick the poor to the curb by taking away their food stamps, and then when they go to you know, sop up the, uh, the food at the, the fast food joints because they can't afford anything else, they uh, get salmonella. So It's all of one, uh, one big continuity, as you say, seamless agenda from puppet president to puppet president. So on that note, let's turn to food, foodworldorder.com. What have you got up for us tonight? We'll begin with a double shot on fluoride, James, and we'll begin with one from Natural News. Dover Air Force Base ordered to restart water fluoridation. Dover Air Force Base in Maryland, which folks may know as the site where sometimes press are able to see the coffins coming home from our wars of aggression abroad, but I digress. Dover Air Force Base in Maryland stopped adding fluoride to their water system in 2007. In 2010, they reported this in their water quality report. After this knowledge became public, the Air Force issued new orders three months later that forced the base to restart fluoridation. The news could have resulted in Defense Department orders to fluoridate more bases and facilities. So in 2007, the base stopped supplying water to the housing units where the military families live. A private company had purchased the housing, and a non-governmental company took over supplying non-fluoridated water to the housing units and the public school on the base. The base now says they had no requirement to add fluoride in 2007, so they stopped doing it. They are unwilling to say anything more about why they stopped in 07. It's likely that the Pew Children's Dental Campaign heard about Dover, Pew is an advocacy group that pushes for more mandatory fluoridation. They convinced the Defense Department to force more military bases and facilities to fluoridate their water. James, there are links in that to pewtrusts.org. But like I said, it's a double shot. And we have a separate post briefly from experimentalvaccines.org that notes, of course, fluoride toothpaste, poison for your brain, and it reduces IQ. This is something, James, you've, you've done entire episodes on fluoridation of the podcast, have you not? I certainly have, and I hope people will uh, look into some of that. Just uh, type fluoride into the search bar on CorbettReport.com, and you'll get all sorts of interviews and uh, podcasts that I've done. This is another one that, if I could make some rough comparison to what you were just discussing about Oklahoma City, that as time goes by, it just kind of becomes more and more publicly accepted you know, most folks at JFK go, oh, yeah, I don't think, you know, Oswald probably did it alone. 
and the years go by and people think, yeah, I don't know if, you know, Timothy McDay, you know, did it alone. And we learn these things that are kind of, kind of realized, but we don't act like we know them as as reality. So this kind of heartened it's, me. Such an important point. Such an important point because it is just uh, if as long as they can just draw it out over a period of years and then decades, then then any truth, no matter how uncomfortable it would have been if we'd learned it all at once, can be drawn out to the point where people don't get angry about it. But uh, but it is an important point to think about regarding the psychology of all of this. But I I just want to say hats off, uh, extra points and a gold sticker for you for putting as the first fluoride link in your uh, Dover Air Force Base article fluoridealert.org, which, of course, is the first place I always send people uh, to, to for information on that. Just an incredible resource of information on scientific studies and other things proving, of course, the uh, the detrimental effects of fluoride. So so uh, hats off to you, my friend, for that. Well, I'd either have to hat tip to Natural News and or my man Adam in Nova Scotia, I've mentioned, has been helping out posting on foodworldorder.com for the last couple of months. And that's really why there has been such an explosion in coverage one last related fluoride note, James, goes to our friend Barbara Peterson and farmwars.info. New studies show fluoridation fails to reduce cavities in New York City and nationally, this being just a, a press release. New research shows that fluoride chemicals added to U.S. public water supplies are not reducing tooth decay as promoted and promised by government agencies, reports the New York State Coalition Opposed to Fluoridation. Using federal statistics, the West Virginia University Rural Health Research Center reports that urban U.S. children with more exposure to fluoridated water and dental care have just as many cavities as less fluoridation-exposed rural children. Now, James and I briefly mentioned that to you in the break. You said, why is West Virginia doing studies about New York City? I could not answer that question for you, but... We'll put it out to folks there to go follow these links and go do more research for themselves. Well, why not? I don't That's care where the uh, <laughs> research is being conducted as long as it uh, shows the truth. And and again, you know, for for folks out there, I'm I'm born and raised in West Virginia. For twenty first twenty eight years of my life, I've been in Oregon for about seven. So being away from it only brings you know m more attention for me. It makes me more of a cheerleader. So hopefully. That research is sound, and it doesn't go into just the, you know, the white lab coats and the scientific dictatorship that we talk about so many times, James. And on that note, what's up next? On that note, we'll do a, a couple of updates for stories that we have mentioned before. I really like this one from Denver Post. George Zimmerman rendered in Skittles. A Denver artist makes his points in candy pointillism. An artist made a piece called Fear Itself, made out of 12,250 Skittles. And it's a portrait of George Zimmerman, of course, the shooter of Trayvon Martin. And that has been the dominant story here in the States for now the last couple of months. And this, I think, gets, gets more interesting. And I add the related note, aside from this artistic piece, Skittles joins food brands at center of tragedy, and, and this I, I find a, a lot more fascinating and, and related to sort of media and pop culture and junk food and all of those things. But this is a, an Associated Press article that notes, it could have been Starbursts, Twizzlers, or Sour Patch Kids, but when Trayvon Martin was fatally shot, he happened to be carrying a bag of Skittles. Now that, of course, has turned into the rallying cry and some of the protest props that people have used. For Mars Incorporated, the privately held company that owns Skittles, the tragedy presents another more surreal dimension. Protesters carried bags of the chewy fruit-flavored candy while marching for the arrest of George Zimmerman. Wrigley Jr. Company, the unit of Mars that owns Skittles, issued only a brief statement offering condolences to Martin's friends and family, adding that it would be inappropriate to comment further, quote, as we would never wish our actions to be perceived as an attempt of commercial gain. Where this article gets more interesting is how it ties into all these other kind of food brands throughout the years that, for whatever reasons, become part of the public lexicon. The Twinkie defense, don't drink the Kool-Aid. These things go to massively important events, I, I would say, in, in history and especially alternative history. And folks may not remember drinking the Kool-Aid. That's about Jim Jones. The Twinkie defense is about... 
Dan White murdering San Francisco mayor and city supervisor. You may know it as the Harvey Milk film. But it's a fascinating bit, I guess, just art imitating life and, and the foods and the companies and, and all of these things. And it's, of course, always worth noting, and, and they do it in the article, it wasn't actually Kool-Aid at Jonestown. It was Flavor-Aid, James. <laughs> well, if there's ever a way to you know exploit a, a terrible tragedy and a, a big big brouhaha for the uh, for purposes of corporate gain i'm sure they'll find a way to do it and that's it here it is um it is an interesting merger and nexus of all of these different you know pop culture and art and and crime and uh corporate uh corporate corporatocracy it's a bizarre mixture of things uh, in that story and a lot to suss out but uh, i must admit i'm going to have to plead ignorance about the Twinkie defense. I, I, I'm totally unfamiliar with that case. Ah, well, we'll have to discuss that sometimes, James. I, I learned about it, you know, years ago when I kind of have was having my own political awakening back in the 90s, listening to spoken word albums from Jello Biafra of, of the Dead Kennedys, who was from San Francisco, where this event took place. But we'll, we'll table that for another time. A couple of quick updates, James. We mentioned last week, or perhaps two weeks ago, in Michigan about the killing of the piglets, the invasive species order. Naturalnews.com has put out the call to action. Join the demand to investigate Michigan DNR director over the forced shooting of baby piglets in cold blood. And you can go to mucc.org and more to learn about this. And we discussed that a couple of weeks ago, James, and it's, you know, it's based on hair color, essentially. Yeah, it was a bizarre story, and uh, I still don't know what to make of it, but it is good to see that at least Natural News is putting the call out for people to get uh, to get involved and to do something about it, because we always run the risk of just taking this news on as if we're passive spectators instead of people who can, can actually assert ourselves and put ourselves in the mix and actually make a difference. So I'm, uh, I'm always supportive of things that get people active and going on issues like this. A couple of stories that make for a strange juxtaposition. Blood device enters arteries, and this discusses just some of the technological advances on what can be put into the bloodstream, medical devices going to work. And they, of course, reference the 1966 film Fantastic Voyage, where a submarine full of scientists shrunk to microscopic size and injected into the bloodstream of a seriously wounded diplomat. People our age, James, may remember it in that film, Inner Space. But again, we are essentially living in the future. So from something very, very small, we'll go to something large. From Der Spiegel, surge in obesity sparks crematorium blazes in Germany. As the number of obese Germans rises, the funeral industry is scrambling to make adjustments in how larger bodies with more fat can be safely incinerated. A number of crematoriums have suffered severe damage when burning fat overwhelmed their emergency measures. And that's all of the article that I posted up on Food World Order, but of course you can get the quite gory details from Der Spiegel. James? Um, I, I think I'll give that one a pass. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but you're certainly right. We are entering Buck Rogers with uh, all of this technology that's coming along. And of course, it's always presented as an unmitigated good. But anyone who's looked into some of the, uh, the scarier aspects of this know that just like any other technology, of course, it could be used for good as easily as it can be used for evil. And it's really a question of who's implementing the technologies and for what purpose and who's deciding how these technologies get used. And we can uh, mm -hmm. always bring that back to bioethics and the, uh, the neo-crypto eugenics and all of that. So unfortunately, that's always hiding under the surface. But of course, having said that, it's always good to see new and uh, novel ideas for approaching old uh, biological problems. Mm -hmm. And we discussed briefly last week Mexico seeing a rise in obesity thanks to NAFTA. And I guess, you know, we sometimes get the impression that, you know, it's just, you know, oh, it's America. America's full of the fatties. And in a way that has been true. But as we see this sort of globalization, just as we said last week, the free market brings you high fructose corn syrup and genetically modified organisms and you have a choice you know you can get a chalupa or a big mac 
Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> again, again, no, thank you. So from foodfreedomgroup.com, James, world's cheapest food is in the USA. And the question is, at what cost? It's interesting to break down that basically Americans spend, what, 5.5% of their disposable income they spend on food for home. And when you compare that to some other countries, it has Kenya at 45% and Pakistan as well. So American food may be cheap, but that's about the only compliment it deserves because when you rely on cheap food, you typically get what you pay for. Behind virtually every cheap burger is a concentrated animal feeding operation, James. There's those CAFOs that we mentioned last week. So what's the cost of a food system based on genetically modified foods? This, again, goes to something that my girlfriend always says. Sure, you can, you know, you can buy the cheap crap now and get by, but it's going to cost you so much more down the road. That's exactly right. And, uh, and of course, when we're comparing, say, U.S. spending per capita on things uh, like food, uh, disposable income on food to somewhere like Kenya, of course, we're talking about a vast discrepancy in just yes. overall incomes. But, uh, but when you start to look at other industrialized uh, developed nations like Germany and France, they still spend a double, sometimes even triple uh, what the U.S. is spending. And that's, uh, that's more due to the fact that they actually tend to buy and, and be picky about their ingredients. And certainly that's the case here in Japan. Uh, um, fresh food is valued uh, to a much higher extent than they were for me back in Canada, and I imagine it's much the same in the U.S. So I think uh, people have to really start looking around the world and, uh, and correlating the people's eating habits with their their health and longevity. And, uh, and Japan is the longest lived uh, people uh, in the, on the planet, so there must be something to it. I find I, I sometimes have to bite my tongue. And, and again, for folks out there that don't know, I, I work at a grocery store here in Portland, Oregon, and I hear people, you know, I hear them every day go, oh, God, that's too expensive. Oh, the, oh, gosh, that's, oh, that's too much. Let's go to, you know, let's go to that other, you know, let's go to Safeway or one of the conventional, you know, national chains that we can get that, you know, for cheaper. And I always want to say, you know, the first thing is, you know, well, your dollar is worth less. So that's why it's more on the first hand. And again, to say, you know, you can get cheap now, but you're going to pay for it a lot more. I bet those hospital bills are going to be a hell of a lot more later than paying a little more now up front. Plus, you know, in defense, I'd like to say that working at an independent chain, you're supporting a, a business that supports its community. And I don't think you get the same thing from Safeway and Trader Joe's. That's right. We'll hold that thought and we'll be back after this to finish up tonight's Food World Order Binge and Purge. Another chance he takes Odds are he won't live to see tomorrow All right, welcome back, friends. We are here in the closing minutes of tonight's episode of Corbett Report Radio. And, of course, in the first half, we were talking to James Lane and Holland Van de Nuenhoff of anobolai.com. And now we're talking to James Evan Pilato of foodworldorder.com and many other websites besides, of course. So once again, James, uh, it's always a pleasure having you here to break down all of this news and information. So much going on that it would be impossible for one man to, to really handle it all. And yet somehow you do. So my hat's off to you for that. And speaking of that, we have a rather large binge and purge to get through. So uh, let's start getting into that. Well, we'll we'll take it pretty pretty sparingly on the binge and purge. That's if you go right now, posted at the top of foodworldorder.com. And again, it's a, a huge thanks to my man Adam in Nova Scotia helping post to Food World Order. It begins strangely enough, James, with a piece from Fox News. People would do just about anything for free food. But how about hugging a Coca-Cola vending machine just for a soda? If you're up for showing a vending machine some love, there's one at the National University of Singapore that's providing opportunities for just that, according to Forbes. The vending machine in Coca-Cola's iconic red color and with the words, Hug Me, was installed as part of the company's Open Happiness campaign. And before long, there were lines of people on campus waiting to give their affection to the dispenser. Hug Coca-Cola vending machine, get a free soda. Now, I put quotes around free because, 
you are paying dearly, I would say, psychically. <laughs> you are paying with your very soul. So, uh, again, there are so many other things on this Binge and Purge that I'll, I'll implore folks to go check out about the uncontrolled chaos of weather going on in, in the Midwest here in the States and also reports of earthquakes in Utah and, and I think also just coming on the heels of, of drills. But there's hugs and drugs, James. Of course, Obama, this summit was completely overshadowed by the whole prostitution scandal with the Secret Service. But basically, at this summit of the Americas, all the other Latin American leaders are all basically saying, hey, the drug war is complete garbage. We want to end it. And, of course, Obama Saya, continuing on from the previous puppet, says, quote, legalization is not the answer. Because, of course, we know run-for-profit prisons are the answer, and we could solve pretty much most of the world's problems if we all just grew more hemp. Certainly so. So some of the other bits, again, on, on the binge and purge notes, a new study, our chemical cocktail evaluated in a new report, food packaging and BPA. So if the food's in plastic, what's in the food? And that's what the Washington Post asks. And we learn so many more things, something not even posted, James, I saw just recently from Grist. This is a new one on me. New study links autism to high fructose corn syrup. And the last thing I want to mention on this massive binge and purge, uh, an amazing exclusive investigation report from Darjumail on aljazeera.com. Gulf seafood deformities alarm scientists. Eyeless shrimp and fish with lesions becoming common with British petroleum oil pollution believed to be the likely cause, James. All right. Uh, just an incredible bombshell there. I hadn't seen that uh, autism report either, but that links into reports of high fructose corn, corn syrup containing mercury that were going, making the rounds a few years ago. Uh -huh. So I hope people will look that up. And then, uh, of course, there's the, the vaccine connection there. So very, very interesting study indeed. But on that note, we're completely out of time. So we'll have to leave it there. As always, James and Pilato, foodworldorder.com, a great resource. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And thank you to all of you out there for listening. Of course, you can get the show notes for tonight's episode at CorbettReport.com slash radio. And on that note, thank you for listening, and I'll see you again tomorrow night.